Good morning. I'll try that again. Good morning. It's great to see each of you this morning. I'm so glad that you're here. I want to begin by thanking Christine Salazar, our Director of Music, for the privilege that she's afforded me to lead from the platform this morning. So we'll be singing together in just a moment, and I'm looking forward to hearing you sing and uh, us singing together. As you can tell, our handbell choir is going to be leading in worship this morning. We're excited to do that. The second song in the service we're going to play is called The Storm Shall Pass, and it is a song that's not like we normally play in service, which is typically an arrangement of a hymn tune that you may be familiar with. This is a song that's written specifically for bells. It has a unique technique that we're going to use that came around in bells about 10 years ago. It's called the singing bell. Guy, takes a, guy or gal takes a stick and takes the bell and rubs it around the edge of the bell and it makes a sound. It's a neat sound and um, it's called the singing bell and this way you can wow your friends and neighbors at lunch today with all of your handbell knowledge. Um, that, I was hoping to get a laugh out of that. But anyway, <laughs> that, uh, that'll be a good thing. The second song we're going to, or the, rather the first song of the service that we're going to do uh, is a wonderful arrangement of Brethren We Have Met to Worship. Our bell choir loves to play it. They love to play it because they get to hit the bells with sticks and, and beat them on the table and all kinds of fun stuff. And no, we don't tear anything up. This is expensive equipment, so we don't do that. But we have indeed met to worship. So whether you're here in the room or joining us through the internet, uh, it's a joy to have you with us. I love the last stanza, the words to the last stanza of brethren we have met to worship. It says, let us love our God supremely. Let us love each other too. Let us love and pray for sinners until our God makes all things new and then, and then he'll call us home to heaven. And at his table, we'll sit down and Christ will gird himself in service with sweet manna all around. We have met to worship today. I'm glad you're here. Brethren, we have met to worship. Thank you. 
morning, Due West. My name is Christine Salazar, and I am not the worship leader here at the church today since I'm out of town at a wedding. As you prepare to worship together this morning, there are a few things to remember. One, Holy Week is coming up. Palm Sunday is March 24th at normal service times, followed by Monday Thursday on the 28th, then Good Friday on the 29th, which are both happening at 7 p.m. Finally, on the 31st is Easter. On the large activity field, we have a 715 sunrise service. In building C, there is a 945 modern service. And in building A, we have 815, 945, and 1115 services. There are so many options to pick from that at this rate, we might start branching out into the ice cream business because of all the flavors. If you didn't get it, talk to Matt Bolin. He wrote the script. The Easter extravaganza is March 24th from 2 to 4 p.m. To make sure this event is as exciting as possible, we are asking for individually wrapped candy donations to Admin 2 before March 18th. If you would rather donate some of your time, we also need help stuffing eggs for the egg hunt and the Easter walk. Packets of eggs can be signed out from Admin 2 and need to be returned by March 18th. We have a web page for all of the summer camps being held here at Due West. Check out this link or click on the banner on the home page of the website to view all of the options. Ignite will not meet March 10th due to the spiritual life retreat. Regular Ignite will then resume on the 17th. Mission trip dates for 2024 are finally set. To learn more, use the QR code on the screen or go to signups and then select missions on the church center app. The deadline to register is April 15th. The missions ministry is looking for a team of people who are interested in coordinating must summer lunch this year. Being a part of this mission does not commit you to being available each week of the summer, by the way. If you are interested in serving on this really important team, please contact Mark Hellman ASAP. Thank you so much. Come one, come all to help beautify our church grounds. Sunday, March 17th, we are having a work day here at Due West. Come to worship dressed in your work clothes and bring your tools. Contact Mark Hellman for more information. Finally, remember to check out this week's Insight for any other events that we weren't able to include in today's video. Now, prepare your hearts for worship. Thank you, Christine. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. You can sing with a smile on your face. Would you stand if you're able as we sing now?
invite you this morning to join with me with the Apostles' Creed as we profess what we believe. So Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, as we lift up the concerns in the church, as we share every week, whether it's Sam or me or David, there's so many in the life of this church. And as I read over the prayer list each week and think of us praying for all of those, there's just things that are so close to all of our hearts. And so today, I just want to share a few things with you. Um, first, let's just have some praises. There's the kickoff of spring soccer that is coming up, and we're very excited about that. You hear the birds sing, and it's time to get ready for spring, so it's a joy to think about having all those children here. We also have many concerns, and so I'll share some with you. There's been prayers requested for baby Collins due to a tumor on their liver and while the baby's waiting for a liver transplant. So let's remember that baby in our prayers. We pray in this church for the search for a youth director because that's just key to getting our youth and keeping them moving in the right direction. And we know that God already knows who's coming so we are just going to pray that the discernment and wisdom is there to get the right person in place as we move forward with all of the, the youth. And Sam is this morning down in the Due West 101 class, so he and Taylor came back this week, but we want to continue to pray for Jan, Taylor's mother, and their whole family as she deals with pancreatic cancer and they have hospice care in right now. There are so many others with cancer. And we have many deaths as well, so I wanna share those with you this morning. We wanna have prayers of sympathy for Jimmy and Julia Buckaloo on the passing of Jimmy's sister. Also for Linda Campbell and family on the passing of her father, Jim Setzer. And for the family of Wesley Bassett, who is a young father that has children involved here in the programs at the church. And also, I lifted up last week, but the family and friends of Lakeland Riley, the young girl who was killed at UGA. I came home yesterday, and we came by the cemetery where she had been buried, and there were students sitting by her grave and many adults standing around. So we want to remember all of these. So I'll give you time to lift up your own concerns, and then we'll go to the Lord in prayer as I close. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Father, we first just want to thank you. We want to thank you that we've gathered together. I want to thank you for David's sermon on prayer because that's where we start. It's just you and me, you and the ones that are here, and we're just talking and lifting up all those things on our hearts. We know, Lord, that there is so much sadness in this world, and there is so much sickness, and everywhere we look, there is cancer and illness. And we know also, Father, that you give us the, the know-how, the doctors, the scientists. Every day, things, there are improvements and things that come about that we didn't even have a year ago. 
And that's only through you and opening us up and letting us recognize through science how much there is to learn. We pray for those families, Lord, who are struggling, whether it is with death of their loved ones, whether it is with sickness, or where it is that they are the ones that are towards the end. Because what we know, Lord, is in those moments, no one can enter in except you and them. So many times, Father, as I've said, or David, or any of those that are here by that bed, we can see the peace that can come to that loved one because I think they hear your voice. They know that you are there and that you are there to usher them in as they transition from this life to the next. So although we miss our loved ones, there is comfort when we know where they're going. We also pray for those around this world and in our own country Almost every day, every week, I lift up leaders around this world, Lord, because there is darkness inside some of our world leaders. And they continue to pull people into war for territory and for power. And so we pray for those who are losing homes and loved ones. We recognize that evil is there, but we also know, Lord, that our hope exists in you. And that where you are, there is hope. Where you are inside of us, we can hope and know that in the end, ultimately, it all turns out for good. We thank you for Jesus Christ our Lord and our Savior, and during this season of Lent, Lord, we are reminded of the sacrifice and the love that he has for each one of us. So let us pray and keep him close in our hearts as we reach out to others so they may see the joy that we have that comes for you. And then it is infectious, Lord, And they want it to. We pray all this in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. I invite the ushers now to come forward as we do the offertory. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you so very much for the opportunity to give. We know, Lord, that this money goes in so many places, so many ministries, touches so many people. And so let us give with joy, with generosity in our hearts, because you have given us everything. And so as we take these gifts today... We know that there are going to be hundreds of people's lives touched by what we do here in this church, and we thank you for that. Amen. As they take up the offering, the slides this morning are from the Scouts. It's from a camp out and from a retirement of a flag ceremony, and we're so grateful for our Scout troop here.
every good habit starts with a good intention. Working out, tidying up, meal prepping, and time with family are all good intentions. With enough repetition, intentions become routines. The same applies to our spiritual lives as we seek to grow. But what will it take for our holy intentions to become holy habits? Good morning. <clears throat> Good to see you all this morning. We are so glad you're here. If you're new with us, please make sure you stop and visit uh, the Jones at the Visitor Center. It's a great way to find out what's going on in the life of the church and to get connected. Uh, I'm so glad, as always, that my friend Reverend Jeanette Dickens to be here to assist us in worship. Uh, I appreciate her. Yes, thank you. Uh, while Sam is doing Trinity one, uh, Trinity, uh, Do Us 101 downstairs, uh, Jeanette graciously agreed to come and help out so you don't have to hear my voice all morning. So I know that you are grateful for that. Uh, one more thing before we read our scripture. Next week uh, is daylight saving time. So make sure that you set your clocks forward an hour on Saturday night. Some of you might want to go an hour 10. Uh, that would get you here on time. Uh, just a thought, but it, that is next weekend. Our scripture this morning is from 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting with verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy... You have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let us pray. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit in this place. Open our hearts our ears, our spirits, so that we might hear your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Today is the third Sunday in the season of Lent, and our goal during this season, actually our goal always, but this season, is to grow in our love for God, to grow in our love for God. Now, we began looking at the great commandment. We're called to love God with all of our, and with all of our, and with all of our, and with all of our strength, heart, soul, mind, and strength. We are called to love God with everything we have. That's our goal, to grow in our love for God. And we always have room to grow, room to improve. And fortunately, we are Methodists. And John Wesley, the original Methodist, provided us a roadmap to grow in our love. He identified some habits, things that if we practice them, they will deepen our faith and help us to grow in love. We're calling them, of course, holy habits. Last week, we talked about the holy habit of prayer. This morning, we're going to talk about the holy habit of Bible study. Bible study. We are a people of the Word of God. John Wesley was a man of the book. Let me share with you one of his quotes. Wesley said, I want to know one thing, the way to heaven, how to land safe on that happy shore. God himself has condescended to teach the way for this very end. He came from heaven. He hath written it down in a book. Oh, give me that book. At any price, give me the book of God. I have it. Here is knowledge enough for me. Wesley believed in the authority of Scripture. He called himself a man of one book. Now, he read a wide variety of subjects. He wrote on a wide variety of subjects. John Wesley even wrote a, a book on, of medicine. I don't know if you knew that, but he wrote a book on medicine. But at the end of the day... The one book important to him was the Bible. He wrote a pamphlet called The Character of a Methodist, and in that he said of us, we believe the written word of God to be the only and sufficient rule, both of Christian faith and practice. 
So we want to talk about the holy habit of studying scripture, the holy habit of Bible study. So we start with our scripture. We're in 2 Timothy. This is one of the last letters written by the Apostle Paul. And we're in chapter 3 of 4. So these are among some of the last written words we have of the Apostle Paul, writing to his young friend, Timothy. We first meet Timothy in the book of Acts, chapter 16, verse 1, where it says, He, that is Paul, came to Derb and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewess and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. So Paul is traveling, and in Lystra, he meets Timothy. And Timothy becomes a trusted advisor to Paul, a young friend. Paul becomes a mentor. Timothy travels with Paul, is given more and more responsibility. And ultimately, Timothy is given a church to pastor. And the letters that Paul wrote, our New Testament books of First and Second Timothy, are encouragement and help to Timothy as he is pastoring. So he writes to Timothy in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy about Scripture. But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The first part of our Scripture for the day. Continue in what you have learned from infancy. Remember, Timothy's mother was Jewish. And Jewish parents took very seriously their responsibility to teach the scriptures to their children, to pass them from generation to generation. Now, for Timothy, scriptures would have been the Old Testament. But the Old Testament points to the Messiah. It still contained everything he needed to know to make him wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Paul wanted him to be grateful for his background, grateful for the mother that taught him the scriptures all his life. But then Paul goes on to say, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All kinds of reasons to study scripture. It's useful for us. You heard it. Training. Or, I'm sorry, teaching, correcting, rebuking where necessary, training in right, righteousness, equipping us for every good work. Plenty of reasons to study Scripture. Plenty of reasons. We want to talk about this holy habit because when Paul talks about studying the Scriptures, it does not sound optional, does it? He doesn't give you a lot of wiggle room. He does it. So we're looking at this holy habit of Bible study. Now, I know you're, you're wondering, when we talk about Bible study, am I talking about sitting at home alone, studying the scriptures, or am I talking about being in a group, a small group Bible study? And the answer, of course, is a resounding yes. That's what I'm talking about. Both. Taking time at home on your own to read and to study, but also being in a group. We can learn so much from each other. Now, before we get too deep into this, let me speak a little more broadly about that, about intentional small groups. A small group Bible study is certainly an intentional small group, but we always want to be a part of an intentional small group. Sam did a great job last fall talking about those. We touched on it again in January. A group of people who come together. Wesley believed in this. Wesley required the early Methodist to be a part of what he called class meetings. They were an intentional small group. Class meetings. Not only would you look at Scripture, but everyone had to answer the question, how is it with your soul? The early Methodists were required to meet together and hold one another accountable for growing in love. The early Methodist movement grew rapidly, not because it had the best preaching, but because its members held one another accountable for growing in their faith, for growing in love. It is one of Methodism's great contributions to Christianity. 
Uh, we could have done a whole week on small groups as a holy habit, but I would be doing Wesley a disservice if we at least didn't mention it. But back to Bible study. Again, plenty of reasons to study the Bible. In January, we talked some about the how of Bible study. This morning, I want us to think about the why. You heard what Paul said, teaching, correcting, rebuking, training, equipping. There are plenty of reasons. I want to touch on three this morning. The Bible, it tells us what to believe, how to live day in and day out. And finally, it helps us make sound decisions. What to believe, how to live, and to make sound decisions. First, what to believe. If you sit down and you read the Bible cover to cover, I suggest you don't do that in one sitting. Okay, take some breaks. Uh, but if you sit down and read the whole thing, you'll see that it's a grand sweeping story of a God who creates us, loves us, and wants to be in relationship with us. You see that at the very beginning. God creates the heavens and the earth, and then he creates Adam and Eve. He loves them. He wants to be in relationship with them. He places them in the garden, and they have a perfect relationship with God. And God offers them anything and everything, with one exception. They are told not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So as soon as they are told not to eat from that tree, what do they do? They go and they eat from that tree. And God says, what have you done? And Adam says, it ain't my fault, it's Eve's idea. And Eve says, it ain't my fault, it was the serpent's idea. If you didn't know, Adam and Eve were from the southern part of the Garden of Eden, which is why they have a southern accent. Uh, the, but not only were they disobedient, they were prideful. Things we still struggle with today. They were given a perfect relationship with God, and they broke that relationship. But still, God created us, loves us, and wants to be in a relationship with us. You continue to read the Old Testament, and you see people continue to be disobedient and prideful. And God continues, time after time, to offer them an opportunity to be in relationship with him. And then we get to the New Testament, and we're told in the fullness of time, at just the right time, God came to earth to be one of us, to live as one of us in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Not like us, because he lived a perfect life and then sacrificed that perfect life so that we could be redeemed. We could be restored. Our relationship with God could be made right. We could be forgiven and offered eternal life, offered life in the presence of God here and in the life to come. God loved us with a love that's beyond our comprehension and wanted that much to be in relationship with us. So today we have that opportunity. Because of the love of Jesus, we have that opportunity to be in a right relationship with God. What did we sing as children Jesus loves me, this I know. Why? It tells us what to believe. It tells us what to believe. And it tells us how to live day in and day out. It's not complicated. It's really simple. We talked about the great commandment, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second one, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love God, love neighbor. How to live is not difficult. We just don't always do it. Some of the biggest mistakes I've made in my life have come because I wasn't loving God and loving neighbor. How would your life be different? Your family be different? All of your relationships be different. If consistently, without fail, we loved God and loved neighbor. I, most of you all know that our son, our middle child, is deaf. When he was growing up, we lived in a town, and I, wrote, I was in another neighborhood, and I passed a sign that said, Deaf Child Area. And I thought, we need one of those in our neighborhood. 
So if this, our son is out playing in the yard, playing in the driveway, and a car rides by, they are aware. You know, if you honk the horn, he can't hear you. Uh, that would be, we need one of those in our neighborhood. So I started researching, how do I get a deaf child area sign in the neighborhood? And I found out there was a particular branch of the city government, a particular city official, who was responsible for just that. So I made an appointment. I went in, I explained our family situation, and I requested getting a deaf child area sign in our neighborhood, and I was politely told, no, we don't do that. And I had taken a picture of the sign I had seen. I said, well, you have done it. There is precedent. Here's the picture. And the, he said, well, I'm sure that's not in the city limits. I said, actually, it is in the city limits. I'm happy to take you and show you exactly. I'll give you the address. I will take you there myself and show you exactly where it is. The precedent has been set. You did it for them. I would like you to do it for us. And he said, basically, that's not in the city. I don't believe it's in the city. But even if it is, I told you the answer is no. Well, he gave me an excellent opportunity, a marvelous opportunity to love God and love neighbor. <laughs> uh, I'm embarrassed to admit I passed. Uh, I didn't take that offer. Uh, instead, I may have said something along the lines of, you know, this city might run a little smoother, smoother if you people who work for it had any idea what was going on. And for some reason, he took that as offensive. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't, uh, don't understand. And he said something back to me, and I said something back to him. And at the end of the day, I, I, I didn't get my sign. And that's all on me. Because I know how to live. I know how to live. I am called, no matter what's going on around me, to love God and love neighbor. Things go better when we do that. And of course, it helps us make sound decisions. It helps us to make sound decisions. The Bible is filled with wisdom. Read the book of Proverbs. But read the entire book. The whole thing uh, will tell you, help you make sound decisions. The more you read, the more you know, the more you live it out. You'll find the better decisions we make. I'm right now, you hear us talk about disciple Bible study. I'm in a group doing disciple two. We cover Genesis, Exodus, Luke, and Acts. We're still in Genesis right now. But every week, part of the study, after we study, after we read the scriptures and discuss them together, every week we ask, answer this question. In what new ways will this session's message, in other words, the scripture we've read, influence my daily thoughts, attitudes, and actions? So I continue to become more like Christ. In what new ways will this session's message influence my daily thoughts, attitudes, and actions so I continue to become more like Christ? In other words, how are we going to live this out? How will this affect what we say, what we do, what we think? The more we know, the better our decisions become. Studying Scripture is a holy habit. It's a holy habit. It's like, as I was thinking about this, I, I thought back to my early days in, in the Army. Uh, the first time I had to take a PT test. Now, for, in the Army, a PT test is a physical training test. You have to remain in a certain degree of fitness. They changed the requirements here and there, but when I was starting out, you had to do a certain amount of sit-ups, a certain amount of push-ups, and you had to run two miles in a certain amount of time. I had trained for this. I was ready for this. I knew I was going to do well. But remember, I'm also the chaplain, and I had a job to do. So our first sergeant was overseeing the test, and I went to the first sergeant, and I said, I'd like to go first because we got soldiers that are going to struggle, and I can't encourage them if I'm busy taking the test. So I want to go first. So he let me go first. So I'm standing next to the first sergeant as soldiers are getting ready to take the test. And one kid comes up, and he says, hey, top which is an army nickname for the first sergeant. Hey, Top, can we, and he asked a question about the test. The first sergeant doesn't even look at the kid. He just raises a hand and does this. And the kid sighs and takes off. Another soldier comes up. Hey, Top, can you tell me? Doesn't say a word. Soldier takes off. Happens a third time. 
And for the life of me, I cannot figure out what's going on. And I'm embarrassed to admit to the first sergeant that I don't know what's going on. But I was curious enough that I broke down and said, okay, top, I don't get the hand signals. What's going on? You know what he told me? (laughs) Yeah, top, thanks. Uh, But I don't get it. He said, chaplain, you know FM 2120? And I got it. I got it. I said, yeah, FM 2120, FM is for field manual. It's the Army field manual for physical fitness and training. And he says, he was kind of a man of few words, in all honesty. Uh, And he said, you'll see, it happens every time. They'll come up with a question, and they want me to spoon feed them the answer. I won't do it. Or they'll come up and wonder if they can bend the regulation just a little bit. But I won't allow it. Chaplain, everything they need to know about this test, everything they need to know, it's in the book. All they have to do is read the book. Everything we need to know is in the book. Everything. Everything for teaching, correcting, rebuking, training in righteousness. Everything on what we're to believe, how we're to live, how to make sound decisions, and so much more. It's all in the book. All we have to do is read the book. It is a holy habit. And for, for this and for all of our habits, God gives us, uh, helps nurture us, gives us what we need to develop those habits. And one of the ways he does that is through the body and the blood of Jesus, through the sacrament of Holy Communion. So as we prepare to come and receive this sacrament this morning, hear this invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, he gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night that he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, 
that we might be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to come and receive this sacrament, I remind you that the table does not belong to us. It belongs to God. All are welcome who want to come and receive the grace of God and live in the grace of God. Also, let me invite those now who are helping to serve to come forward. As our servers are coming forward, I'll remind you that as you come, you'll be invited to place your hands in the shape of a cross to remember the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. You'll be given a piece of bread invited to dip that into the chalice uh, and receive communion that way. If you need gluten-free bread, we have that here at the table. Simply come to the table, if you would, and ask us on either side of the table, and we're happy to provide you with gluten-free bread. Lord's table is open and you're invited to come as the ushers correct you.
If you would please stand if you're able and we'll sing together our closing hymn. Following the benediction, turn and greet your neighbor. Tell them God bless them and tell them you, tell you enjoyed worshiping the Lord with them today. Gracious God, give us as your people a hunger for your word that we might take it in and that we might live it out. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, Jesus' name we worship, and Jesus' name we go forth. And all God's people said, amen. <laughs>